Wrestling legend Jerry Lawler, you can do better than that. Up on your feet for crying out loud. One more time, Jerry Lawler. Sorry, I jumped the gun. I didn't wait for the introduction. But it's your fault. You told me to go, right? <laughs> no. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Thank this you. So cool. This is awesome. Yes, it is awesome. So uh, before we get to the audience questions, uh, anything you want to say or you want to jump right into the questions? It's just so nice to have you here. Well, thank you. No, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. This is my first time at Steel City Con, and I'm just blown away by it, especially to be in the same room, to be in the same room with not only all of you fine people, but with the Christmas vacation car back there. That's so <laughs> awesome. I got to go back there and get my picture with that before this is over. Oh, yeah. So um, I, I don't know if this is the first time. I've done a lot of Comic Cons. I've done a lot of, uh, uh, of these, uh, what do you call them? The panels. Panels, but never by myself. So oh, this is great. I'm going to depend on you to help me with this. So. Well, I want to get right to the beginning. You started off as a disc jockey. How did that lead to wrestling? <laughs> That's a good question. See, I'm going to start off. <laughs> Very good question to start off with. Um, yeah, you know what? I, somebody just mentioned a while ago, uh, I, uh, they mentioned my Superman ring that I wear all the time. And because when I kind of look back at all the crazy stuff that's gone on through my life, it all kind of started in my mind or my memory. Uh, most of my memories are in black and white. So I, <laughs> it goes back to um, the 1950s when Superman TV show came on, uh, came on TV for the first time. George Reeves uh, was it's my all-time favorite Superman. Most of people don't even realize who George Reeves is but, uh, or was. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I became a, just a huge Superman fan. And about that same time, I realized that I had the ability to draw pictures. And so, uh, like this, like I said, this was about five or six years old. So I started drawing constantly Superman. I mean, so, uh, so then uh, I just kept drawing Superman all the time. Instead of when I started in school... I'd get notes sent home from the teacher to my mom and saying, you know, uh, he's a kid's a great artist, but he needs to concentrate on his schoolwork. But, you know, he just draws all the time. So um, I, I, I think I'm trying to remember the first time I realized that I saw Superman comic books. I was always just a big fan of the Superman TV show. Then I saw Superman comic books as I got a little older, and that's what... That is when I made up my mind that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a comic book artist for DC Comics. I wanted to draw Superman and Batman when I got older. So all throughout school, I majored in art. Um, and, and even when I finally graduated, I won a full tuition scholarship to uh, University of Memphis for commercial art. And somewhere there, um, when, I, when I just got out of high school was the first time I got interested, my dad was a big wrestling fan, and it was the first time I sort of got interested in, in watching wrestling. There in Memphis, we had a Saturday morning wrestling show that came on, a 90 minute long Saturday morning live wrestling show every Saturday, and so um, started watching that with my dad, and all of a sudden I realized, or I thought in my mind, I said, gosh, you know, I've been drawing superheroes all my life, and I'm looking on TV, and I said, these guys are like real life superheroes. So then I started drawing pictures of wrestlers, and, um, uh, and, and, and the drawing sort of leads up to everything. You asked me about being a DJ. At that same time, um, I think I was just a, actually a senior in high school. I hadn't actually graduated yet, but there was a big-name a big DJ who came through Memphis from, from uh, California named Scott Shannon. Now... Scott, believe it or not, is still on the air today. He left Memphis, went to New York, and became the top DJ uh, in New York City. And he's still on an oldie station in New York City today, Scott Shannon. But he, we, he came through Memphis in like, uh, gosh, 1965, 66, something like that. I graduated in 67. But um, he had, the, he had the sh a radio show that everybody listened to, all the teenagers at least, listened to every single night. And one night, or one, one um, week on a show, he had this, um, he had this character. Radio, radio was so great at the time, you know, you didn't have to see anything. It's all, you visualize this stuff in your mind. And Scott Shannon had this segment in his show every night where he said that um, 
He told everybody that he had a, uh, a creature that he kept down in the basement or the dungeon of the radio station, and he called it a gazork. That was his name for this creature, this gazork. And what he would do, he had a segment on the show. He said, hey, if anybody out there, he said, I have to feed this thing like six or seven times a day. It just eat me out of house and home. And he said, he'll eat absolutely anything. So if anybody out there is having a problem with a teacher or principal or somebody that's giving you a problem, you give me their name and I'll feed them to the gazork. So this became a big deal in, in, the, in the city. Everybody, everybody's calling up and, you know, I think I called up one time and I said, yeah, my principal, Mr. Mabry, man, I had to go in. He gave me three, uh, gave me a paddling today, right? And he said, well, you know what? I just happen to have Mr. Mr. Mabry right here in my studio. And then you'd hear a voice in the background. Somebody starts screaming. He said, no, come here. Come here, Mr. Mabry. And he said, you're going, you're getting fed to the gazork. And then you'd hear this big monster chewing. Like I said, this is all in your mind. You know, you hear this thing chewing, chewing something up. And then all of a sudden they go, burp, big burp at the end. And he said, well, Jerry, you're not going to have a problem with Mr. Mabry anymore. And so that was a big thing. And so all of a sudden, one week, he, he announced that he was going to have a contest for fans out there that listen to the show to draw what you thought the Gazork looked like. Bingo. That was, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, right down my alley. And the, the first prize was a color TV, right? A color TV. Second prize was a stereo and, and all of this kind of stuff. And we had a black and white TV. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, if I could win a color TV just by drawing, this would be the greatest thing in my life. So I, um, I sat down and I started drawing Gazork pictures and I must have done about 50 and I sent them all into the, to the station and um, and the day the day before they were going to have the uh, uh, the unveiling of the winner announce the winner it was going to be at the grand opening of this new mall in Memphis uh, called Southland Mall and uh, this was like one of the first this is back this, tell you like I said this goes back to the 60s when malls were just getting started right so this was a big deal they're opening the mall first ever appearance live appearance by the the uh, DJ Scott Shannon. And they're going to announce the winner of this contest. So I, I, go, the, I go out there. But the day, uh, actually the day before the contest, I'm sitting at home that night, uh, the day before the contest announcement, I'm sitting at home and my phone rings. And I answer it. And it's, I never forget that voice. It's Scott Shannon on the telephone calling me at home. And he says, uh, Jerry Lawler. And I said, yeah. He said, this is Scott Shannon, man. And I'm like, Oh, my gosh. He said, listen, I just want you to know that I loved your artwork. I loved your pictures of the Gazork. I'm going to use one in my, uh, in my advertising. He said, but um, uh, he said, the only problem was the station thought that you sent in so many. Like I said, I sent in like 50, 50 entries. He said, you sent in so many entries that um, they, they're going to award you. They, they were afraid to award you the first prize because they thought that it would be rigged or something because you sent in so many entries. But you won second prize. So I was disappointed that I didn't win the color TV. But anyway, I got this, I got this nice stereo and all this sort of stuff. But the next day when I go to the, um, go to the uh, announcement and the appearance for the first time of Scott Shannon, uh, it's a huge crowd, partly for the uh, grand opening. But this guy was such a big name in, the, in town. It was the first ever time that anybody got to see him in person. I'd never seen him. So... All of a sudden, they introduce, just like you did, they introduce, here he is, Scott Shannon, comes out, they got thousands of people there, right? And I'm standing, I'm standing looking over his shoulder, and um, all of a sudden, here comes this guy out, he's in a white jumpsuit like Elvis Presley, no shirt on, he's got this white uh, uh, scarf around his neck, long blonde hair, and the girls are like going crazy, they're just going nuts, it's like Beatlemania again, right? And I'm looking around, and I thought, heck. Forget about being a DJ. I, want, I mean, forget about being an artist. I want to be a DJ like this guy, right? So I, I, I get awarded the second prize, and then he calls me off to the side and says, look, I, wanna, I want you to come down to the studio, come down to the station. He said, I want to talk to you about you doing some artwork for me every week for my, for my radio show. At that time, he would put out a, uh, like a top 40 list of all the, all the records, uh, the, like the Hot 100 records or whatever. And he wanted me to do a caricature of him 
And uh, like this is just a, a time that's gone by. I mean, there used to be record stores and that sort of stuff. And he put these, uh, these surveys out in the, in the record stores every week. And I would draw a picture on it. So I would get to go down to the station every week with my new piece of artwork with, with Scott Shannon. <laughs> And, uh, and then, then I got to, after a while, became friends with him and, and got to hang out and watch him do the radio show. And after a few weeks, I finally got the nerve up to tell him, man, this is something, Scott, that I would love to do. And I was just, I just uh, started uh, in college then. So he helped me make a, uh, he helped me make a, a reel, uh, like a promo reel. He, he got all the records out, and, he, and, and, and while, while the record was playing, he's making a, a, a promo reel for me. He told me what to say, turn the microphone on, and I did this stuff, and all of a sudden he made me this tape where it sounded like I was a real DJ. And he said, you take this tape around to radio stations. <clears throat> he said, first thing, take it, to, um, you know, take it around the radio station. You might get a job. And sure enough, I, I, got a, I took the tape, I knew really nothing about it. I just, I mean, I let him make the tape for me. And, uh, but I took the tape around, and I got hired at a radio station uh, as a DJ on a country music station, uh, which, and, and all of a sudden I got the same shift that Scott Shannon was on. I was on from 7 to midnight playing freaking country music. And, like, I'm, you know, I'm a teenager playing country music, and Scott Shannon's got all the, all the kids listening to him over there. But he said, kid. You know, you got your foot in the door. They take any job you can get. So that's, that's where I started out as a DJ. And, and when I look back on all this crazy stuff that happened in my life, everything was so coincidental. Um, while I was on this country music station, in the afternoons, uh, the, the local wrestling show advertised on the country music station, right? And so the, the station that I was on was a little small station, KWAM. Still on the air somehow, but uh, in in Memphis. But it was in a little a sm the studio was in a little small Quonset hut. And the whole studio was about as big as from from here to that wall to that that post right there. That was the size of the whole place. And so um, every week, though, on Monday nights when the wrestling was in town, they would send a wrestler by the studio to make a live a radio interview. So I'm. I'm all of a sudden just sitting there in the, in the afternoons getting ready for my show, and then the, some wrestler, Jackie Fargo, would come in. You know, he was like the big name wrestler in town. Jackie Fargo would come in the station, and he'd have two or three beautiful girls with him to drive up in a big Cadillac, and he'd come in, and, and you know, he, he, thousands of people are going to come see him that Monday night, and he'd go into the studio there with, with uh, Eddie Bond, uh, the other DJ, and he'd cut a promo about, you know, who he was going to beat up that, that Monday night. And I'm watching this every week. He's coming. To, these wrestlers are pulling up in these big, nice Cadillacs and got pretty girls with them and everything. And I'm thinking, I'm in this little quantum. I'm thinking, man, being a wrestler would be a lot better than being a DJ, right? So that's where I first got it in my mind. And then, uh, and then a, a little bit after that, I, I sent some. Uh, I sent some of my drawings into the TV station that. Um, uh, my drawings of wrestlers into the TV station. They aired the wrestling on Saturday mornings. And uh, I got a call from uh, the, the unmistakable voice of Lance Russell, who was the, uh, he was the announcer on our, on our wrestling show there in Memphis, calls me up on my phone, and um, he said, is Jerry Lawler? I said, yes. And he said, well, we got your pictures. Everybody likes them. We're going to show them on the air this Saturday. And uh, as a matter of fact, one of our wrestlers wants to meet you because he wants to know if he can hire you to do some drawing on a he owned a nightclub. He wanted to hire you to do some drawing on his nightclub. And that was Jackie Fargo, who was the big, the big shot wrestler in town at the time. So I got to go down to the TV station. They showed my artwork on TV, and I got to meet Jackie Fargo. He hired me to come and do some drawings at his club, and he and I became friends after that. And, and he was the guy that finally, I, uh, like I did Scott Shannon, I started asking Jackie, is there any way that, you know, I would love to try this one time? Could I just be one of the... Saturday morning guys that you guys throw in there and beat up, you know, the, the job guy or whatever. And, and he discouraged me at first, but finally he stuck his neck out to the promoters and let me be one of those guys that they threw in on Saturday mornings. And that's, that's how I got started in the business. That was 52 years ago. And uh, I've been doing it ever since. He, he, he actually told me at, at, at first, he said, I'll never forget, he said, kid, you're too good an artist. You, wanna, you don't want to get involved with wrestling. Stick with being an artist. 
And I told him, I said, Jackie, if you just let me try it one time, I promise you I'll go back to being an artist. I won't bother you anymore. Just let me do it one time. Of course, that was 52 years later, and I've, <laughs> I've been to wrestling ever since. I, I just had to, my first match was in December of 1970, and I just had my last match uh, last Saturday night in Tom's River, New Jersey. So I've been doing it constantly for 52 years. And it all started with Superman. Oh, what a Thank great you. story. Boy, I'm glad I asked that one. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get shorter answers from now on, though. <laughs> uh, did you always, use, you always use your real name even when you were the DJ? Yes. Well, no, not when I was a DJ. You're, you're right. Uh, I didn't think about that. Um, the, the, and I don't even know. I, I kept my initials, JL. But as a DJ, I was Jeff Lane. And I think the Lane came from Lois Lane. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, so anyway, yeah, I was Jeff Lane as a, as a DJ. And then, uh, but once I got into wrestling, it just was always Jerry Lawler. So I got one more question before we open it up to the audience, and I got to ask you, how did your relationship with Andy Kaufman start, and how did that grow? How did that even happen? How many people have already heard this story a million times? Uh, not me. <laughs> no, okay, not Please. you. Okay, well, let me just tell you. Um, <laughs> no, a Andy Kaufman was, without a doubt, the greatest thing that ever happened to my career, and, and, and one of the greatest things that ever happened to wrestling. I just had... I just had uh, um, dinner probably three, about three weeks ago. It's funny, th this is a better story than Andy Kaufman. Uh, about three <laughs> weeks ago, I, uh, I, have a, I have a restaurant that's basically right on the end of my street. It's a, 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 a Japanese restaurant called, called Sakura. I go there for sushi a lot and everything. So uh, my son, Kevin, calls me and says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm just sitting at home. He said, want to go to dinner? And I said, okay, come over. We go to Sakura right by my street. He gets over to my house about 6 o'clock. We go down, sit, have dinner, talk, get through, come to, back to my house, and it's about 8.15. I drop him off. He gets in his car and leaves. So at about 8.25, my phone rings, and I look at it, and it's an Indiana number, just a number that I didn't have in my, in my uh, phone. And I started not to answer it because I didn't recognize it. Then I thought, ah, it might be a promoter from Indiana, you know, want to book a show or something like that. So I answered it. And this voice on the other end was a young guy, and he goes, oh, my gosh, Mr. Lawner, I'm so glad you answered. And I said, who is this? And he tells me his name, and he says, he said, um, I, I was supposed to call you two days ago. He said, um, Nick Khan has just flown into Memphis uh, on a WWE corporate jet, and he's having dinner with The Rock, and I was supposed to call you two days ago and invite you to be at the dinner with them. And, and he said, unfortunately, it's happening in about two minutes. It's at 8.30, and it was like 8.28 at the time. And he said, I just forgot to call you. I don't know what to do. And, and I said, well, where is it at? And he said, Folks Folly. And I said, well, you know what? You're in luck because Folks Folly, like top wrestler in Memphis, is like one minute from my house. So I said, I'll, change, I'll throw on a different shirt, and I'll be there by 8.32. And he said, oh, my gosh. Please don't tell him that I forgot to call you, would you please? <laughs> I said, no, I won't. I won't, I won't say it. So uh, anyway, I get there at like 8.30, change, change shirts, go over to Folks Folly, walk in the back room, and there's The Rock and Nick Khan, who's the new CEO of WWE, right? And they got a seat right next to The Rock waiting for me. Like they, they thought I'd been invited three days ago. So uh, I just walked in at a moment's notice, sat down with The Rock, and we we sat and we had dinner for like three hours. And one of the things that he said to me, getting back to Andy Kaufman, was uh, he said, King, I don't know if you believe this or not, he said, but I would probably not be a movie star today if you had not ever had the, the wrestling match with Andy Kaufman. Because he believes, as Triple H has said too, that that match with Andy Kaufman back in 1982 started the crossover of wrestling and Hollywood, basically, so to speak. It got so much publicity and so much uh, uh, notoriety back in those days that Vince McMahon, immediately after that, if you, if you remember, that was the time, and it was because of the notoriety that Andy Kaufman got it. He, he, Vince later told me, he said, I was so freaking jealous when I was sitting there in New York and watching you and Andy Kaufman on the David Letterman show. 
He said, because, you know, New York was that, that was his territory. And here's a Memphis wrestler up there when it could have been done, he thought, with one of his wrestlers. But um, so right after Andy Kaufman and I did our deal there, immediately the next WrestleMania, WrestleMania, he brought in Cindy Lauper. He brought in Mr. T. And then that just started the ball rolling, all the Hollywood stuff. And then that, and like The Rock said, if that had not happened, you know, there would have never been that crossover where wrestlers, wrestler would not have been even thought about to be in, in, in movies and that sort of thing. So, I, you know, I felt good about that. But Andy Kaufman was, uh, was a great guy, best thing that ever happened in my career. And, uh, and it just, it was sort of like the, when I look back on all the stuff that happened, it was just kind of a, a coincidence or whatever that had happened. You know, he just fell in my lap, so to speak. Andy was, uh, Andy was a huge wrestling fan. As a kid growing up, he said he used to do nothing but stay in his room, watch TV constantly. And one of the main things that he loved to watch, he was from Long Island, New York, was wrestling. And his favorite wrestler was this the big bad guy at the time, Nature Boy Buddy Rogers. He was a huge fan of Nature Boy Buddy Rogers. And I sat with Andy uh, when he was telling me his whole history, and he said, I, I would watch this guy, and I could tell, he's I'm like 10 years old, and he said, I could tell that he in, was intentionally trying to make me not like him, which he was, you know, he was being a bad guy on yeah. TV, right? He said, I could tell he was intentionally trying to make me not like him, but I still liked him. And so he said that, that sort of um, uh, stayed with me to, throughout my entire career. And if you go back and look at Andy Kaufman's stuff, um, he, he said, I'm not a comedian. I hate to be called a comedian. I've never told a joke in my life. And he said, I'm, a, I'm like a wrestler. I'm a performance artist. And he said, I enjoy, after watching the bad guy wrestlers, I always enjoyed making my audience feel uncomfortable. And if you ever watched any of, An any of Andy's stuff, that's what he, that's what he did. He even, created, he even created a bad guy persona with Tony Clifton so that he could play the bad guy in his, you know, in his comedy shows. And then once he got, you know, on, on Taxi and he got to that, uh, uh, I guess, sort of the height of his popularity, he decided that he wanted to live out his childhood fantasy of being not just a bad guy, but a bad guy wrestler. So that's when he started wrestling women. He, he felt like, you know, he wasn't a big enough guy to wrestle men, so he, he, he started wrestling women in his, in his nightclub act. He went on TV shows. Merv Griffin, Mike Douglas, all of these shows, Saturday Night Live and stuff, wrestling women at the time. And uh, he felt like it just wasn't being accepted the way he thought it should be by wrestling fans. So <laughs> then he, he set out on a mission to get to wrestle women in front of a wrestling crowd. So he, he approached Vince McMahon Sr. at a show in Long Island, New York, and uh, he, he told him the whole deal and, and how he wanted to wrestle women, that he'd been wrestling women. And he, and he told Mr. McMahon, and this is Vince's father now, Vince McMahon Sr. So he told him he would like to wrestle women in, at a, one of his shows in front of a wrestling fans. And thank goodness Vince said, well, Andy, I appreciate that. But uh, he said, I'm just hesitant to involve an actor because Andy was on taxi at the time. He said, I'm, in, I'm hesitant to involve a Hollywood actor with my wrestling because I think it might make the audience think that we're all just actors, which basically we were, but he didn't want people to think that. So, um, so he turned Andy down, and, and, and I had a good friend named Bill After, who's a um, magazine editor. Bill still, still is a, mag a wrestling magazine editor. He overheard the conversation. He knew Andy. He called Andy off to the side and said, look, I got a friend down in Memphis, Jerry Lawler, and he and his partner, Jerry Jarrett, have an entire territory. They run wrestling shows every night of the week. At Monday nights at the Mid-South Coliseum, they draw 10,000 fans, you know. So he, see, he gave Andy my number, and uh, the next day, Andy, at first Bill after called me and said, hey, you know Andy Kaufman? I said, I know who he is, the guy on Taxi, right? He said, yeah, yeah. He said, well, he's going to call you tomorrow. I said, Andy Kaufman's going to call me? He said, yeah, he wants to, he wants to wrestle girls uh, in front of wrestling fans. And I told him, you guys might be interested in doing it down in Memphis. And so I said, oh, yeah. And so sure enough, Andy calls me the next day and tells me, tells me what his idea was. And I said, come on down. 
And all, all of the rest, I mean, that was, that was what was intended to happen with Andy Kaufman and wrestling in Memphis. He came down. We brought him down just to go out. And the first week, sold out with him. He sent in some interviews, kind of making fun of women, making fun of wrestling, that sort of thing. And he came to Memphis. We had a sellout at the Mid-South Coliseum. And the whole, the whole deal was Andy would go out to the ring. He would challenge women in the audience, and they would raise their hand if they wanted to win $500 if anybody could beat Andy Kaufman in the ring in three minutes. And so he, uh, I mean, it was all legit. He went out to the ring. Women in the audience raised their hand. They picked out five different women, and they all came <laughs> down. They Each one of them got three minutes in the ring with, with Andy Kaufman. And, um, and, you know, he was able to beat every one of them. And that, that was it. We thought that was going to be the whole thing. And he came back afterwards, and he was so excited. And, and me and Jerry, Jerry, my partner, were just looking out at 10,000 people, and we said, <laughs> This is awesome, right? So we said, Andy, would you like to come back again next week and, and have it like a return? Do it again? And he said, oh, could I? We said, yeah, you could. We, you know, we've drawn crowds like this. So that's, that's how it all turned out, and, uh, or that's how it all started out. And all of the stuff where finally I, I, I went to Andy as, uh, you know, he came back about three times wrestling just women, and I finally went to Andy and said, look, uh, you know, this has probably gone about as far as it can go if you, with you wrestling women. I said, what you need to do is you need to go ahead and have a match with a man. And he said, no, 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 I couldn't do that. I couldn't, I, I couldn't get in the ring with a, a wrestler. I'll get hurt. And, the TV, you know, the TV studios, uh, uh, taxi and all their the insurance people wouldn't allow me to do that. So I said, Andy, you and I, thinking how do I get the rub off the Hollywood star, right? So I said, you and I could have a match and I promise you, you wouldn't get hurt. And it would be, it would, we would sell this place out, you know, because the people, I mean, by this time, they, they in, in Memphis especially, they hated Andy Kaufman because he was just, you know, he's making fun of the South, he's making fun of women. And so, uh, you know, they were looking for somebody to put him in his place. So that's, that's how the stuff with Andy and I got started. And, and, uh, and it just went from there. And, and people always ask me, I mean, so much of the stuff that Andy and I did was, like on the spur of the moment, ad lib, just like on the, on the David Letterman show, when we went on that show, nobody, David Letterman, Andy Kaufman, <laughs> nobody knew that I was going to slap Andy Kaufman on that show. We had a production meeting earlier in the day with the uh, production, well, I had a meeting with him. Actually, Andy had a meeting with him earlier when I walked in to meet Robert Morton, who was the, who was the segment coordinator on the Letterman show. And where they would tell you what, what you were going to be on and what you were going to do on the show. I walked in to meet him and he said, he said, Jerry, Andy refused to be in the same room with you. So I met with him earlier and he's already gone. And he said, here's what we're going to do tonight. He said, Dave's going to have you guys on for two segments. First segment, he wants you to guys to be a little bit antagonistic. They'll show the film of uh, Andy making fun of wrestling and making fun of Memphis and and then we'll show the film of you pile driving Andy and hurting his neck. And then uh, Dave would like you guys to be a little antagonistic, not too much. And then we'll take a break. And then the second segment, Andy will apologize to you for making fun of wrestling. You apologize to Andy for hurting his neck. And then Andy is going to get up and sing what the world needs now is love, sweet love. So that was, that was what he told me, and I said, okay, that's cool. And I left, and I went back to the hotel. And um, so that was what everybody thought was going to happen. Before, when I went back to the hotel there in New York, I got a call from Andy, and uh, he said, what well, did they tell you what they want us to do? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, it'll be funny, but I said, once you and I, you know, kiss and make up on network TV, that'll be the end of us doing anything back down in Memphis. You know, we won't be able to continue our wrestling program down there. And he said, yeah, man. And he hesitated. Then, I'll, then he said, I'll never forget because he didn't really use these terms, but he said, wonder what would happen if all of a sudden you just hauled off and slugged me. <laughs> and I said, slugged you? <laughs> and he said, yeah. And I said, oh, Andy, I can't, we can't do that. They're taping the show at 5.30 to show back at 11.30. They'll never show it. I said, second of all, I'll get arrested, and I can't do that. i got to be back in Memphis tomorrow. And he said, yeah, but wouldn't that be great? 
And I said, <laughs> I said, I guess. But anyway, and then I didn't even think any more about it, right? So we go to the show that afternoon, 530. That was the first time I ever even met David Letterman when you didn't get to talk or see David before the show. So I finally walked out on the stage, shook hands with David Letterman, then they, out they, they bring out Andy, and I'm thinking that, you know, we're going to do what the segment coordinator said to do. So we, we went to the first segment. We were a little bit antagonistic like they asked us, and then finally Dave cut to a break. Andy gets up and walks away. He walks off to the other side of the studio because he didn't want to sit beside me. And uh, I'll never forget when, when we went to a break, all of a sudden David Letterman leans over and says, Hey, you know, my first job in television, I used to be the ring announcer for Dick the Bruiser in Indianapolis. <laughs> I said, really? He said, yeah, so I know a lot about wrestling. I said, well, cool. Then that was, that was it with me and Dave. So then Andy comes back. We do the second segment, and he never apologized to me. Basically, we just kept going on and on and on. He's talking about how he could have sued me and all this sort of stuff. And so, And I never apologized to him for hurting his neck. And so I guess... Dave eventually said, well, this has gone off the tracks. And so uh, we'd gone too long. And so Dave just said, well, we're going to take a break and we're going to see if we can get this all sorted out. So all of a sudden, Paul Schaefer started playing the music and I knew we were going to a break and I knew we were out after that. That was our second segment. And still to this day, when I watch <laughs> it back on TV, it's like watching uh, somebody else. It's like an out-of-body experience. I don't know what I was thinking. I just stood up. I looked Andy in the eyes. And I just slapped the taste out of his mouth. I hit him so freaking hard that it knocked him right out of his chair and over and tumbled over and everything. And I'll never forget, I look back at Dave and he's, he, I mean, this all happened right here. And he's just looking forward at the, at the camera. He's just like. <laughs> he had no clue what was just, what had just happened or what was going to happen. Right. And so they, they went ahead and went to a break and a security guard came and got me and took me back to the green room which was full of people when I left to go out. And <laughs> when they brought me back there, it was like empty. <laughs> Everybody's like, bring Jerry Lawler back here. Whoa, let's just get out of here. So I sat down in the green room for like maybe 15 minutes went by. And I guess they're trying to figure out what to do. And now you could hear women out there that sound like people were crying and stuff. And poor Andy's <laughs> holding his head. And so finally, after about 15 minutes, the door kind of opened up a little bit. And this young intern stuck his head in and said, uh, Mr. Lawler? I said, yeah. He said, Dave wants to know if you want to come out and sort of wrap this thing up. So I, I said, sure. Now, I'm thinking now, I'm thinking, they're gonna, maybe they're going to show that or are we going to retape something or whatever. So um, I walked back out, and it was funny. There was a 750 people in the studio audience for the David Letterman show. And from the time, after I slapped Andy and went back to the dressing room, when I came out the second time, they had like turned into a wrestling crowd. They just like boo, it's like boo, boo. Said, okay, okay. So I, I sit, I sit back down. We come back on the air, and right before we went on the air, they were doing ten, nine, eight, and and Andy's still over in the corner holding the side of his head. And Dave said, "Andy, are you going to come back out here or what?" And he says, "No. If I do, I'll say words you can't say on television." So it was like three, two, one. Here we go. And then Dave. And uh, Dave had taken over that show. Just, just this was like the first few months of the of this new show. It used to be Tom Snyder and the Tomorrow Show was on in that that segment. So we come back on, and Dave said, "Well, Andy Kaufman's here, sort of, and Jerry Lawler's here, and some nights I wish Tom Snyder were still here, but that's that's not the case tonight." And then he said, "Andy, are you coming back out here?" And so all of a sudden, I'm just sitting there not knowing what to expect, right? <laughs> So Andy comes over, over Dave's shoulder right here, and, and he lets out the, just the most obscene string of profanity that you've ever seen. And I'm thinking, and I'm thinking in my mind, oh my gosh, now they're, they're probably going to show the slap, but there's no way they can show this. I mean, it was MF, it was everything you could think of, right? On network TV, he's calling me every name in the book, and... I just, I just like, I, I'm thinking you're, you're killing this whole thing, Andy. So I just kind of, with my body language, I just kind of like went to try to show him, what are you doing, right? So he just keeps cursing at me and everything. And now once again, here's Dave again. He's just like looking, to the, <laughs> looking in the camera like he don't know what's going on either, right? And so, uh, and so Andy 
curses me, curses me, and then he stops and he says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to all my fans out there for saying these words, but you, you're an effing a-hole, you know. <laughs> God, right? And so, and then he grabs the, Dave's water and throws it at me, and I jump up again, and then the security guard comes back in, and, and, and then the security guard gets me this time, and he says, he says, come on, Mr. Lawler, I want to get you to the elevator because, and get you out of here because he said, Kaufman's elevator don't go all the way to the top floor. He said, he's going he's gonna to have you arrested. So they took me to the elevator. I went down. I went back to my hotel, and this was at like 630. I didn't hear another word from anybody until 1130 that night when the show came on the air, and I turned it on, and they, they showed everything. I mean, they showed the slap. They showed Andy coming out. They, did, they didn't beep out the curse words. It was even funnier. They put the sound of a cuckoo clock. So when Andy's going, it was going cuckoo, 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 cuckoo. So it made it, it was like hilarious. And you could lips, you could lip read everything that he was saying. And so, uh, I mean, as soon as the show went off the air, the next call that came in was New York Times. Uh, and it was crazy. It got that that thing got so much uh, publicity, and so many people were, were talking about it. like literally, literally worldwide. It got it, it started uh, with all the publicity. But uh, I mean, and and that's how it all happened. And then uh, of course, Andy and I went back to Memphis, and we a lot of people think that we thought that we just had that one match. But Andy loved wrestling so much, and he kept coming back. He was still he was on my show. I mean, Andy and I must have had. 30 matches after that, week after week after week. He, he put out a bounty on my, he put a bounty on me for wrestlers to come in. He would give $10,000 to any wrestler that could put me in the hospital with a pile driver. Uh, I threw fire in his face one day and he was all burned up. It was, I mean, we just did things over and over and over and he just kept coming back until finally he was on my show one day. Uh, I had also had the Saturday morning wrestling show and then I had a Sunday morning Jerry Lawler show that was a like a sports talk show, I would have different guests on. I had Andy, because he was in town that week, as a guest, and it was around Thanksgiving or something. And so we had a little segment where we had a big turkey body on the, on the thing, and we were going to put somebody's head on that turkey, you know, and we we're going to show everybody today who's the turkey of the year in Memphis wrestling. And we're going to actually have him on the show. We're going to interview him today. And all of a sudden, I said, but first, I got somebody that wants, wants to say something. So then, of course, we had Andy in the other studio, and he comes on and he says, let me tell you something, Jerry Law, if you put my head on that turkey, I promise you, I promise you, it'll be the last thing that you ever do. And, and he said, and when he was talking, he said, if you, if you put my head on that turkey, I promise you. And so he was coughing several times, and then after the interview was over, he was like in just in the other end of the studio. We had another camera on him, and it looked like he was in somewhere else, but after the interview was over and the show went off, he came to me and he said, look, I apologize for uh, coughing during that interview. He said, but I just got diagnosed with lung cancer. And it was like, it was like in the movie. I thought, I thought it was going to be another one of his bits. That it was going to be a joke or something, you know, that he was going to say, tell people that he had lung cancer. And then, of course, you know, it'd, it'd just be a, a prank or something. But I said, oh, Andy, that's not funny. And he said, no, I'm, I'm serious. So anyway, he was, that was one of the last TV shows that he was on. Uh, and then this little, literally right after that, he, uh, he started, lost his hair and uh, he, did, he wasn't on TV anymore. But I mean, that was right when, right when he got, uh, he only lasted probably about four months after, after that before he passed away. But anyway, that's how it happened. <laughs> Amazing story. Now, uh, if you don't mind, can we get yes, some questions question from the answer, audience? Sure, Are we good? Absolutely. Uh, if you could come out answers. to the middle of the aisle, come out to the middle of the aisle, we'll get some of your questions. How are you on time? Can you do some? Because we got. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, sure. good, good. One of my favorite feuds that you did was with Kamala, and I know that you helped create the Kamala gimmick. Do you know why Kamala is not in the Hall of Fame? Well, um, I did. I did actually create Kamala. Anybody who here know who Kamala was, the wrestler? Yeah. Well, anyway, he was Kamala the Ugandan giant. And uh, in actuality, he was James Harris from Senatobia, Mississippi. And I was wrestling at the Mid-South Coliseum one Monday night, and I got tapped on the shoulder, and I turned around, and here's this big, big black 
friendly looking black guy and he says, uh, Jerry, my name's James Harris and I wrestle as Sugar Bear Harris and I live down in Senatobia and I was wondering if you guys could let me work on some of your shows here. So I'm looking up at this guy and I said, has anybody seen you here tonight? He said, no, sir. I said, well, look, I want you to go back home. I want you to call me tomorrow. I'm going to take you to Nashville and uh, I got an idea for you. So anyway, uh, once again, going back to my art, uh, my art career, I remembered I had a, a good friend that was a great artist named Frank Frazetta. Now, Frank Frazetta did all these covers of these great, uh, like, adventure, not comic books, but magazines and stuff that uh, people would wrote books, uh, uh, paperback books. And he was a great artist, and I remembered a, a picture that he had painted of, um, it was like a, almost like a Tarzan or somebody's like thing with this beautiful girl like tied to a stake and a bunch of these like cannibals were around her and they were like about to burn her at the stake, right? And have a big feast. And, and so I went home and I found that picture and I thought of a gimmick for this guy, this huge guy that just had me on the shoulder named James Harris from, from Senatobia. At the time, we always tried to do stuff that was topical. And I don't know if you guys remember this, but at the time, the president of the country of Uganda was a guy named Idi Amin. And Idi Amin was a confessed cannibal. He was a real live cannibal, and he'd become the president of a country in Africa called Uganda. So in my crazy mind, I thought this guy would be perfect as the Ugandan giant, we book him as a cannibal, and I painted his face up and everything to look just like this cannibal that I saw on this, on this book cover, right? And so, uh, paint this guy's face up, put a loincloth around him, put a big spear in his hand. Jerry Jared had a big uh, lake in his backyard. We threw some, I'll never forget, it's like yesterday, we threw some dry ice out into that lake and it just started, smoke started coming up. We told James, Walk about out, walk out there till it's about waist deep, and then turn around and just make faces and start coming towards the camera. And so that's boom. That's we started shooting this guy as he came towards the camera with a spear in his hand and his. I mean, uh, this would we would we would get canceled today if we tried to do this, right? <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we put the spear in his hand, this big African thing, and we called him. Uh, and I'm looking at National Geographic magazine, and the country of Uganda is a map of Uganda. And the uh, capital of Uganda is a city called Kamala. So that's where the name came from. We called him Kamala, the Uganda giant. We called, we called up, uh, we made this great video of him. And we called, uh, what was his name? Oh, gosh. Oh, man, who was, who was the manager for the Four Horsemen? J.J. Dillon. J.J. Dillon. We called J.J. Dillon on the phone and said, J.J., we got a new wrestler that we're going to bring in. I want you to shoot a, shoot a little interview. And he said, I don't even know this guy. I said, no, we just created him. I said, I want you to shoot a little interview. We're going to play on TV. And you say that you've been searching the world for the meanest, toughest professional wrestlers. And you've come across uh, this Ugandan giant. And you're sending him to Memphis to, to go against me. So we, we played that video of JJ talking about this guy. Then we played the video of Kamala coming up out of the swamp, uh, and and I went out and said I've never seen anything like this. Anyway, that was the match for Monday night, sold completely out. Eleven thousand five hundred people came to see this guy, who was actually from Senatobia, Mississippi, which is about <laughs> seventeen miles from Memphis. Uh, they came to see this crazy cannibal Uganda giant, and I told James in the back, I said, "Look, you're not supposed to know anything about wrestling." You're not to have ever been inside a big building like this, so every, every time you go out, you just look like you don't know where you're at. I said, don't do anything except chop me and try to bite me because you're a cannibal, right? And so that was, that was the way Kamala the Ugandan Giant was created, and, you know, he went on from I mean, do huge money for us and then went on to the WWE and did, did uh, big business with Hulk Hogan and everybody working for Vince McMahon up there. And uh, as to why he's not in the Hall of Fame, it's just, I, I, I don't know, it's just a matter. I'm sure he will eventually, but I, the Hall of Fame exists actually in Vince McMahon's mind. He was the guy every year that was, he would sit down at 
three weeks before that and decide who he was going to put into the Hall of Fame every year, you know. So uh, I, I don't know why Andy Kaufman is not in the Hall of Fame, you know. But anyway, that's that's a story on Kamala. He was, uh, but I was, he was a great friend of mine, James Harris. And I would, it was, it was like, it became like a hassle because I, of course, would have to paint him up every day. And I, I would have this acrylic paint. I'd sit him down in the dressing room before he and I would go and wrestle each other. And I, the, the, I would paint him from what, the, what this uh, guy on this cover looked like. He had a big white star on this peck, a big white star right here, a big yellow crescent moon on his stomach, a star on his head, teeth, big teeth here and everything. So I had to paint him up every night. And I, do this every night, and so one night after I've been doing this for about six months, <laughs> he, he's sitting there and watching me, and finally he said, I got one question for you, Jerry. I said, what's that? He said, why does you paint a big banana on my stomach every night? <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. I said, I said, James, that's not a banana, that's a crescent moon. He went, oh, okay. <laughs> but anyway, that was a uh, he was, a, he was a cool guy, yeah. Yep, there yes. Is. So we've got time for just a couple more questions. You're okay. going to be headed back to your table to sign yes, okay. and hang out. First of all, I've got to tell you amazing stories right off the bat. we got, we got, give it up. This is just wonderful. Thank you. Can't thank you enough. we got two more questions. Let's make it happen. Jerry, one of my favorite feuds of yours was with Randy Savage. Uh, how they came in and they did that rival promotion. Like, there was real heat between the two of you from the things I've seen and stuff. What made did that... Did you say there was no heat or real, real, real heat? heat. Okay. Real heat. And then he finally came to Memphis. Well, how'd that all come together and... Well, that just may your be a, opinions on that, Randy. That may be a longer answer than the Andy Kaufman story, but I, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to shorten it up. But yeah, um, I don't know. Have any of you guys got to see any of the Tales from the Territory shows? Uh, well, that, that's, that's kind of cool because that's the way it used to be in the, uh, back, before, back before the 80s. In the mid-80s, everything that, I mean, cable television changed everything. That was the, that was the, it wasn't Vince McMahon, it was cable television that changed wrestling worldwide. Because before that, everything was syndicated, everything was local, and there were 32 different territories in the United States. This country was made up of 32 different territories because nobody back then nobody flew everybody drove on the trips so in order to be able to uh have a wrestling office and then for the wrestlers to be able to drive to uh like most of the in the middle of a territory would be an office and then that territory would consist of about two uh, what 200 mile radius or so of where the main office was because that's where guys could conceivably drive to a city and then get back home and have like a like a if it be a three hour drive to a city you'd have a two hour show and then a three hour drive back home and that was like an eight hour work day that was like a, you could have a, like a normal life you're basically working eight hours you're driving six of it and you're doing two hour wrestling show so that's the way it went Every, nobody really flew that much back in the day of, in the early days of wrestling so that's why the country was di divided up like that. So our territory was in, um, our territory uh, consisted of all the state of Tennessee, all the state of Kentucky, southern Indiana, eastern Arkansas, and northern Mississippi, and northern Alabama. So that was like a 200-mile radius of Nashville. That's where our main office was. So we, we, would, we would promote cities every single night of the week within that 200 mile radius and we you know the wrestlers would go out and, and work those shows every night well back in the day sometimes you would have what we called opposition and that would be if like a if like a guy that wanted to be a promoter but he couldn't get a job with the established promotion sometimes he would just go off on his own and and kind of start promoting towns running wrestling shows just like to what today is independent wrestling. You know, they're not a part of uh, the WWE or anything. They just run independent shows. Well, that would happen sometimes back in the territories, and we call that opposition. And so Randy Savage's father, uh, well, Andy was his brother. Angelo Poffo was, was, was Randy's father. 
he started opposition to us. He started to run shows on his own in Lexington, Kentucky, which was one of our basically towns that we ran once a month. So Angelo Papo started, he got a little group of wrestlers, which his son, uh, Lanny, and of course Randy, his son, uh, they were his main stars, and they, they would just run little towns around Lexington, and they got themselves a TV show on in Lexington. So the way they, the way they became sort of popular was they would go on their TV show and challenge all of our main wrestlers, you know, and say that, uh, I'll never forget, you know, Randy Savage would go on TV every week and say, he'd like to cut a long promo about me saying what he was going to do to me in the match that we were going to have this week at their little opposition show in a, in a high school gymnasium outside of Lexington and, and make the people think that I was going to come there and wrestle him on the show and, but then every time at the end of the, you know, at the end of his promo, we would say, well, that's what's going to happen if he shows up. You know, so that was their, that was the way that they were like trying to guard themselves saying that it wasn't false advertising or whatever. But so um, we all, <clears throat> Jerry Jarrett and I always just had the, we just had the uh, mindset that the best thing to do with that is just ignore them. So we never, we, you know, we never talked about them because that would give them credibility. So that, that really ticked Randy Savage and his dad and his brother off. And one day, uh, one day to try to uh, put a, something on their TV show uh, that would give them more credibility. That's all they were doing, looking for some kind of credibility. They sent a camera on a Monday when they knew that I would not be home, when they knew that I would be driving. I was living in Nashville at the time. When they knew that I would be driving to Memphis, Randy Savage and a camera crew of theirs came to my house in Hendersonville, Tennessee, which everybody knew, they knew it was my house, and he's driving up, you know, and, and they start filming him, driving down my driveway, and said, yeah, this is Jerry Lawler's house. I'm going to see if he'll come out and face me right here. You know, he won't come to any of my shows and face me. I'm going to come to him. So he's up there, he goes knocking on my door and all this kind of stuff, and naturally nobody was there. I was down in Memphis, and he knew that. And then, uh, anyway, then he, he broke a window in my house on this on this tape right so there was like there was like real legitimate heat but then the, the thing that jerry jared just kept saying this we gotta just ignore him he said i promise you if we ignore him they'll die out they'll go away so we just ignored him one time he randy savage and bill dundee saw each other on the on the like at a rest stop on the interstate and they almost came to blows i think dundee pulled a gun on him or something so there was a legitimate kind of heat there but finally, finally, they did just kind of die off and, and were about to go out of business. They ran out of money. And so they called Jerry Jarrett and I and said, look, is there anything? And, and, and actually, I think Randy had about, was about to get a contract to go to WWE. And so we, without telling, without telling anybody that we had gotten together in Indiana Way, we booked the match at Rupp Arena in Lexington, Kentucky. They would see 15,000 people me and Randy Savage and a loser league town match. And so all the people that know, you know, the people knew about the heat and, and everything that had happened between the organizations. And so we had, we had to have two referees, one of our referees, one of their referees. We had our ring announcer, Lance Russell there. They had their ring announcer there. Uh, we had Eddie Marlin in my corner, Angelo Papo in his corner. So it was a big, it was like a big organizational match. And, um, and so then it was, that was the first time that we actually worked with, together with them and the last time because they were like out of business after that. But yeah, there was a little heat, but it all, it all turned out well. We, Randy and I turned out to be um, uh, good friends and, and worked together a lot, you know. And this patient young man has the final question. Once again, thank you. Here's the final question. Nice quick one. Okay. Now I'm just going to get my luggage on back here. Jerry, I am... I am very pleased to um, speak with you right now. I'm Frank Stover. And WWF, WWE legend? Yeah, I know it sucks, the name change sucks. Yeah, I'm talking to you, we're what? Life fun? Okay, so my question is, um, how does it feel in order, well, how, how does it feel during your commentating career? How, did, how does it feel throughout your commentating career? How, do, how does it feel to be in that position? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, um, I never 
I never thought about other, you know, I wanted to be a radio disc jockey. But when I got into wrestling, I never even thought about being a commentator. I never, uh, I never, I just never thought about it. You know, I knew there were commentators out there. And I knew that, you know, one of the big things that was important in being a wrestler was your ability to communicate, you know, when you got the microphone in your hand to be able to talk to the people and get them invested in what you're going to say. So wrestlers' promos were as important as their wrestling ability. And I always knew that. But I never even once thought about being a commentator. And talking about going back to Randy Savage, when I first started in, uh, and just the other day, as a matter of fact, was my 30-year anniversary of being in WWE. It's 30 years ago, like this week. So, so almost 30 years ago, I, I got here and I started wrestling. And I you know, wrestled Brett the Hitman Hart, Jake the Snake Roberts, Ultimate Warrior. I had all these wrestling uh, you know, feuds and that sort of thing. And, and then all of a sudden along came the big Monday Night Wars. And that's when WWE and WCW were having battling it out for the ratings supremacy. And WCW was trying to steal talent from WWE all the time. And they did, they did steal a lot of guys away. And so at that time, I forget, I think I was maybe wrestling against Bret Hart or about to wrestle against Bret Hart. And, um, Randy Savage was doing the commentating with Vince McMahon. Vince was the play-by-play guy. Randy Savage was the color guy. And so one night, somewhere up in the Pocono Mountains, we're getting ready to do our show. And at that time, WCW came on an hour before our show did. So they got an hour jump in the ratings game against WWE. So we, uh, we would be, and, and a lot of times, um, we, we, you know, we would see what they were going to do before we went on the air. So we were getting ready to do the show, and I'll never forget Vince was walking around saying, anybody seen Randy? Uh, I need to get with him about what's, what we're going to talk about on the show tonight. And I hadn't seen him, and everybody said, no, I hadn't seen him. So anyway, about an hour before the show, somebody said, uh, Vince, you might want to come and look at this. And they had turned on the WCW show, and all of a sudden there's Randy. Oh, Yeah. He's on, he jumped ship without telling anybody, and Randy Savage was all of a sudden on WCW that night. And I'm, this is another thing I'll never forget. Vince, in the business we call put it over. He didn't, he didn't uh, his expression never changed. He looked at the TV, he saw Randy Savage, and he looked around, and he said, King, would you do commentary with me tonight, and next week I'll have somebody to do it on a regular basis. But will you help me out tonight? I said, yeah. So that... After that, I was there for the next 25 years. <laughs> and I never, honestly, I never, I can't say I never liked it. I mean, I, I did enjoy it somewhat, but I never went there to be a commentator. I always, you know, my first love was wrestling. And, it, and for a while, once I realized I'm just going to be a commentator from now on, I, I never really liked it that much. But, you know, then they put JR with me and then they put, uh, but I mean, uh, for a while, I, I, I did commentary with Vince for a long time. I had really enjoyed working with Vince. He was really funny to work with. And I did some commentary with, with uh, Gorilla Monsoon and then, of course, then JR and then Michael Cole and a lot, of, a lot of different guys over the years. But now wrestling was always my first love. And we thank, thank you, you so much for all the stories. Thank you, guys. Give it up. Jerry the King Lawler. Thank you. I think you can do a lot better than that. What a great Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I said, I said I've done a lot of panels. Most of the panels I do have about 12 or 14 people at it. But this, is, this was great turnout. Thank you all for being here. Thank Appreciate you. It. Hi, this is Aaron Ashmore, and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe like, like now. Oh, and have fun and follow your fandom.